For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God chose his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We're going to do something a little different this morning, um, something that you may not have seen before in a sermon, but something I've prayed about, something that I've, I've thought a lot about. It's actually been consuming my thoughts over the last few days. I've, I've been scarcely able to accomplish any other task except thinking about what we're going to be doing this morning. But I'm not going to explain it. I'm just going to do it. So here we go. What is it about a sunset? Something about looking at that sun setting down over that water. Setting the waves and the sky ablaze. Bathing you in golds, purples, reds, and blues. Depending on the evening, it could take your breath away. A man once said that a picture is worth a thousand words. I can scarcely put into verbiage what a father feels when he holds his son for the first time. We understand pictures like this because we all like thinking of happy things. But as we look at pictures that elicit joy and happiness, we think back to all the times that we were happy, where we shared time with friends, maybe the dreams of our youth. We think back to all these times and remember the good old days as one show titled itself Our Golden Years. Those are the thousand words that each picture like this one fills us with. And as we look upon them, it's easy to build ourselves up and think about the good times. But the problem with thinking about the good times is that it's impossible to do so without at least one thought of the bad times. I think it's because we hold, we hold the good times so well in our minds and our hearts so clearly is because at times it seems like they're few and far between. But when we look at these pictures, pictures of loneliness, of depression, of heartache, Pictures of addiction. Being at the bottom of our barrel. Pictures that remind us of our helplessness, our inadequacy, our losses, the holes that are left in our lives by the absence of others. But maybe more than anything, our compromises. The ground that we have given in the battle for our hearts, our minds, and our souls. But as we think back over these pictures, maybe a thousand words isn't enough. Because we're filled with the idea of what if? What now? 
We wish we could go back in time. We wish we could cycle back through all these things that we felt. All these compromises that we've made. To get back to a point where we were happy. But the problem with going back in time is that the only way to get home is to go back the way we came. Each of us, each and every one of us, has a picture worth a thousand words. It's a picture we're confronted with every single morning. When you pull ourselves out of our beds, when we go into the bathroom, when we look in the mirror, we're confronted with these thousand words. And for each of us, they're different. But I will put to you, for the majority of us, many of them are similar. Why am I here? Might be some of them. What's it all about? Might be others. And where some of them might be what a happy thoughts like and, and hopeful thoughts of the future, like what am I going to do with my life? Where our voice goes up at the end of that sentence. Too often, those words are changed in tenor to what have I been doing with my life? Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? And the problem with that perfect vision is all that perfect vision seems to do is remind us of how inadequate we are. How hopeless we are. They say that when you die or have a near-death experience, that your life flashes before your eyes. I heard in a comedy once where that happened, where the, in the story of the comedy that happened, and a man almost died, and he said, my life flashed before my eyes. It wasn't that long. <laughs> Imagine that for a second. I don't think that we have to experience a near-death experience for that to be the case. Flash your life before your eyes now. Consider those pictures as they come up, each of them worth a thousand words. What do those words say? How does the novel of your life read? Is it a story of joy, of triumph, over adversity? Perhaps. But maybe, just maybe, it's a story of pain, of heartache, of loss. Too often, the thousand words speak to our weakness, to our faults, to our failures, instead of our strengths. Too often, those thousand words make us cry instead of laugh. You might say we're only as good as the sum of our parts. Solomon will render it as a man thinks in his heart. So is he. We decide who we are. And if we choose to listen to the advice of those thousand words, we define ourselves as hopeless, worthless, A young woman sits on a stone step. She looks me in the eye and she says, God could never forgive me. What I've done is too horrible. Another woman sits across the space of my desk from me. 
She too looks me in the eye and she says, I feel like there's no turning back. My husband has treated me as though I'm worthless. And I'm starting to think that maybe he's right. A man wraps his arms around me, tears pouring down his face, asking the question, why would God want me? No one else does. Why would he be any different? Those people chose to listen to the thousand words. Because who better to define us, right, than the mistakes that we've made, than the compromises that we've made, than the addiction that we've suffered and given ourselves willingly over to. We might be to the point to where we can no longer make the choice for ourselves, but we made a choice to begin with, right? No one else is responsible. We can be as narcissistic as we want on the surface and say that it was always someone else and never us. But we know deep down that even the most arrogant among us, even the most ignorant among us, have to know somewhere down deep in the pit of the bottom of our soul that the only one responsible for where we are now is me. It's me. Yes, I might have been lied to. Yes, I might have been betrayed. Yes, I might have made some choices that I can put potentially on someone else's shoulders, but at the end of the day, whose choices are they? They're mine. And then in the cold light of day, with the thousand words screaming at me, I realize that I'm not so much the man that I want to be as I am the man I never wanted to be. Do you ever wonder why the suicide rate skyrockets during the holidays. <laughs> we could go on and on and on and talk about how there are so many reminders of other people's financial status and other people have their family and if we're alone we might, we might feel depressed about that. But at the end of the day, it's when the thousand words scream too loud. When we're confronted with the images that scream at us. Whether it's lipstick on a collar. whether it's an empty glass next to an empty bottle. Whether it's a man alone on a dock. Whatever the case, the more we choose to listen to those thousand words, to remind ourselves of our mistakes that we've made, the more we convince ourselves that they're right. After all, we're people of evidence, aren't we? We only believe in what we can see, touch, taste, feel, and measure. And according to that standard, we have been weighed and measured. And we found ourselves wanting. But we're not the only one that sees these pictures. We're not the only one that looks back over these images. Who sees the loss we've experienced. Who sees our helplessness and our destitution. Who sees our addiction and our inability to control our own desires. who sees our desperation, our heartache, and our loneliness. There is another set of eyes who sees each one of these things in turn. 
and where they scream to us a thousand words, reminding us of how worthless we are, how alone we are, how empty, how weak. To him who sees these pictures along with us, he only hears one word, love. We look at these pictures and we see a man who has nothing left, who is more concerned with his own desires than the desires of others who is alone, who has lost everything. We see the mistakes and think to ourselves, I'm worthless. He sees our mistakes and sees a soul worth saving. The verse says that he reconciled us Do you know what the word reconcile means? Usually it's used in legal proceedings in reference to divorce and marriage. They get a divorce because they can't be reconciled. The word means to take two parties which are diametrically opposed to one another, who are at odds, and make them at peace. What better way to put two people at odds than for one to see one thing and the other see something completely different? There's an old joke about a whole song about what he said, what she said, and what he heard, and vice versa. He said, he came home and he said, Sweetie, I just bought a motorcycle. She heard, I want to have a really big fight. She said, can you go shopping with me? He heard, can I pull your fingernails out with pliers? What better to put two people at diametric ends of the spectrum away from each other than perception, right? Right? We see one thing when we look at these pictures, but God sees another. He doesn't see someone worthless. He doesn't see someone empty, hollow, spent. He doesn't see someone ugly. He sees someone worth saving. The verse says, reconciled. But that's not all it says. It says that while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, while we were as the thousand words describe us, at the right time, right when we needed it, he died for the ungodly. we listen to the thousand words too much. Because we're the ones that give them voice. You have to decide tonight, this very moment, who are you going to give credit to? Who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to give your trust? The thousand words that say a thousand times that you're worthless? That you're hopeless? Or the thousand, or the one word that God proclaims to you at the top of his lungs to the point to where it can drown out those thousand other words? Love. Valuable. Worthwhile. 
God knows your mistakes. He knows what you've done. He knows where you've been. He knows your compromises. And he loves you anyway. (laughs) So the choice is simple. The thousand words or the one. If you want to listen to the one this morning, if you want to start ignoring those thousand words, all you have to do, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're a Christian who's forgotten or someone who's been swallowed by their sin and wants to put it away forever, who wants to realize through the waters of baptism that you serve a God, that you have access to the blood of a son who loves you more than him his own life, who sees the things that you've done, who knows the compromises that you've made and realizes that this person who has made all these compromises, who's made all these mistakes, who has made, who's taken his body and his life and the lives of others around them and spit on them and wasted them, that person is not a person who's deserving of wrath. That person is not a person who is deserving of failure, of, of depression, of loneliness, but is instead a person who is deserving of of my own life. If you want to start listening to that word, the word that reminds us that we are a people who are or can be saved, if you want to listen to that word, and not the thousand words that scream our inadequacies, all you have to do is at this moment come while we stand and sing.